Hello, welcome to the Monroe Live podcast. I'm Tom Perche, your host for today's show. I'm Director of Electrification for Monroe & Associates. Um, Here today we have Tom Malagny. Am I saying that right? Yeah, sounds good good to me. Good, all right. And uh, he's the host and creator of State of Charge uh, YouTube channel. And uh, he's wearing his shirt proudly today as, a, as evidence of that. He's also a senior editor of Inside EVs and also Inside EVs podcast host. Um, he's uh, president of Charging Ahead Consulting Services, LLC. And he's also a program coordinator for Plug in America. Please stop me if any of this is um, old news or obsolete. Um, EV- so I will stop you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, for three and a half years, I did the Inside EVs podcast, me and uh, my three um, podcast mates, Dominic Yoni, Martin Lee, and Kyle Connor. But recently, about um, four months ago, we actually left the Inside EVs podcast and started our own podcast. It's called the Batteries Included Podcast. So um, ah. everything else seemed pretty up to date, but uh, we do have a new podcast now that uh, that the four of us own and, and run. We're not doing the Inside EV show anymore. They have four new hosts and they're, they're actually doing a good job over there also, but we wanted to do something that we owned. So we started our own podcast. Understood. And that explains why as I scrolled, scrolled through those podcasts, I didn't see any of them that you were hosting. So now that explains <laughs> it. Um, what about uh, program coordinator for Plug in America? Is that still an active role? Yeah. So, you know, I'm more of a consultant with Plug in America now, um, a, a, an advisor for a while. Uh, we actually, about five or six years ago, uh, Plug in America decided they wanted to tackle a big problem, which was um, uh, dealerships and their their lack of understanding electric vehicles. So uh, they dis- decided they wanted to start a, a dealership training program. So they hired me. They brought me on to co-develop the program. And it was called Plug Star. And it's a, a dealership training program. So I did that for, for about three years full time, actually, and uh, worked with close to 600 dealers, I think, in uh, in eight different states, um, in teaching them, many of them in person. Some of it was online, but but many of them, hundreds of them were in person, training the staff on better, how to better understand electric vehicles, how to communicate savings to, to customers. Um, and uh, over the course of the last year, I've kind of taken a lesser role uh, with that now. So um, uh, I'm not so active in the PlugStar program anymore. I'm more of an advisor. Okay. And then you have a website, EV Charging Stations, with a comprehensive EV Charging Station re- review um, that you provide the public. Um, so that was pretty interesting to scroll through. So, yeah, thank you for your advocacy and enlightening the public on all the things they need to know about EV Charging Stations. Um, and then co-creator of the PlugStar Electric Vehicle Dealership Training, yeah, you already touched on that. So. You know, this is a subject near and dear to the hearts here of uh, Monroe and Associates. We get a lot of requests for training of all different aspects of electrification. So it's nice to see that there's a program in place that actually provides some certification as it relates to, you know, your, our plug-in solutions. So that is the introduction. Um, as I mentioned um Earlier, before we started the show here, I took the opportunity to look at a rather uh, interesting interview that you had with Out of Spec Dave. So, uh, you know, the sort of life story of, of yours, and uh, I found it to be intriguing. And um, I, it allowed me to come away with some stuff that we can talk about as a side discussion. But really what, you know, where this should go first is about the state of the charging industry, right? You've got what is just the build out of the infrastructure, both, you know, residential and commercial locations. You've got technology evolution, everything from DC fast charge to uh, shouldn't it have a solar panel canopy over the top of it all the way to, hey, wait a minute, why are we storing power locally in batteries? Shouldn't we be looking at, you know, other ways to uh, contain the energy to prevent us from having to use the grid for everything on and on you've got 
then inductive charging, you know, what's the, the future there? Are people going to be able to be plugless as they go forward? And then lastly, oh, yeah, let's put those in the road. And we've got one here in Michigan that just got initiated for the, you know, first for us. And, uh, you know, tell us, where's it going? Um, you know, where are the pain points going to be? What should we be looking for? Oh, geez, is that a loaded question or what? Where's it going? <laughs> I keep you busy. <laughs> I wish I wish I knew where it was going. You know, there's there's you know, we're when you think about it, we're in such a point of infancy in this um, you know, this industry. Uh, you know, I, do do I see at some point down the road inductive charging in roadways? Maybe. Uh it would be brutally expensive. I mean, it would be awesome if we could get to that point, but you know, I just can't imagine the expense of that, you know, uh, you know, so that's way down the road, you know, inductive charging for personal use and maybe even in parking lots, um, that would be, you know, what would come sooner, uh, you know, what, what, what I, what I would think, you know, uh, Tom, uh, you know, where, where are we going? We have to work on the grid. There's a lot of work that has to be done on the grid uh, on site energy storage is going to be a combination of, uh, maybe providing more power generation, uh, on-site energy storage, smart load balancing, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home. I mean, there's a potpourri of all of that's going to get mixed in over the course of the next, say, 20 years. This isn't going to happen overnight. It's going to take a while. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I do see the industry transitioning and I see, um, you know, smart homes with, you um, being able to use your vehicle's battery as a you know insurance policy, a backup for the grid goes down. Everyone's going to be able to do that in you know twenty years out. Let's say um, a lot of people are going to be able to do it in ten years out, but um, you know it's it's going to take it's going to take a couple decades. This is an enormous trans you know transition sure. uh, off of off of uh, you know oil as far as personal transportation goes. And you have been blazing a trail the whole way, um, you know, amongst your many firsts, the first public charging station in the state of New Jersey. Is that right? Is that, am I phrasing that right? You know, with your early uh, uh, program with the Mini, if I recall. So I believe it was. I don't have any proof of that. I mean, if you want to count like a, a 240 volt outlet, like a plug as a charging station, I guess they, they were out there first. But Back in 2009, when I was in the Mini program, and, and at that point, there were no production electric vehicles in, in, on the roads. Tesla had a few roadsters out there, and there was one or two in New Jersey that I knew of, but there was no infrastructure in New Jersey. And uh, when I was in that Mini E program, I installed a public charger at my my uh, restaurant. Now, J1772 wasn't wasn't invented yet. All the, the EVs that were out there had their own proprietary plugs. But um, the Mini E program that BMW was running was in New Jersey. So uh, I installed one of the chargers with uh, that the Mini E's could use at my restaurant. So it was a public charger. And uh, the funny thing, was, it was the best thing I ever did. I didn't even think of it. I put it in for me, really. And I said, well, if anybody wants to use it, she can. And I posted it online and in the Mini E Facebook group and so forth. I couldn't believe how many people were coming to my restaurant to charge. <laughs> and it was, it was uh, it, you know, that's like the light went off. Like, like wow, like, um, you know, the, you, you could actually use a, a a charger like you know as like a like a fishing lure to get people into your restaurant <laughs> and now they spend money there so you know i mean and that that's important because with public charging people you're not going to make money selling electricity it has to be the uh the secondary services and goods so you know that that's you know these public charging let's say rest stops to the convenience store model that we have now where it's gasoline and a convenience store that they make money selling the convenience items. They don't make money on gas. They, they basically, many of these franchises break even on the gasoline and they make all their money selling cigarettes and soda and coffee and, and, and milk and all that stuff. And, and the, the, the elect, the public electric vehicle charging, uh, you know, industry has to do the same thing because they're not going to make money selling electricity. So, um, that's how I see really the, 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 the bulk of public charging going. So, you know, you, you take that to the, the next level and you talk about, well, what are those value added things that they can go after? Uh, I would start with reliability. You know, if you have a, a favorite brand of uh, charging source you want to use, you probably want to pick one that's 
you know, at least got one or two working stations when you get there. I know in my own very limited experience, that's very frustrating to get to a location and have it not work. And uh, uh, just to close that subject, I have a, a colleague of mine who's in England, and he has a very strong theory about what's happening there. Um, claims to have compelling evidence that, yeah, yeah, this is kind of an oil industry thing where they're buying up all these charging stations and hoping that everybody has a really bad experience for the next few years. So, uh, you know, conspiracy theories aside, what's your thoughts on reliability and, and what that adds uh, to as, as part of the value proposition, proposition to the customer? What do you think? Yeah. So, well, first of all, I, I you know, I, I love a good conspiracy theory like the next guy, but <laughs> I don't believe that that's happening. It's, the oil industry is working against the proliferation of electric vehicles in a lot of ways, but I don't think it, they're doing anything with the hardware because the, 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 the hardware from other companies that have nothing to do with the oil industry is just as unreliable. It's not like the units that the oil companies you know, shell recharge network and, you know, the, 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 the ones that the, that the oil companies are running that they don't work, but everything else works great. Nothing works out there anymore <laughs> except the Tesla network. So, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I just think it's a matter of, as far as reliability, Tom, that this is all new equipment. This is, a, this is a new industry. You know, I've talked to Electrify America at this in great length and, you know, they basically had to invent the 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 chargers that was all first gen stuff um and and you know they they almost kind of expected it not to work that great now now we're on the second generation stuff it's still not working well so um something's going on there but um i don't think it's a, a conspiracy um and but as far as evaluated yeah and and now that the tesla supercharger network is going to open up to other manufacturers and you know, even the the legacy cars with ccs you'll be able to use it with an adapter um that's that's going to put a lot of pressure on all the other networks on EVgo, on ChargePoint, on Flow, on on Electrify America here in the U.S. at least to 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 improve their their reliability. If they don't, the people just won't go there, and and they'll 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 just all look for Tesla supercharger networks. Tesla will continue proliferating their uh th their network. And um, they'll be an extraordinarily dominant force, even more so than they are now. Um, and that might happen uh, because I don't see signs of the other networks improving their reliability at all. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. And so you mentioned the supercharger network. Um, uh, just a little backgrounder on why I asked this next question. Um, there's the transition from our four 500 volt infrastructure to what needs to be an 800 volt system. Um, and the few cars that have 800 volts that are out there, I always have some sort of provisional way to DC fast charge at 800 volts from a 400 volt system. So, you know, everything from a dedicated box like in a Lucid or a Porsche all the way to, you know, integrating it into the motor and inverter on an Ionic 5. Um, you know, these are all unique ways. We took apart a Hummer, and the Hummer reorganizes its 400-volt battery into an 800-volt battery for mm -hmm. direct DC fast charging. Um, we now heard what Tesla's done, and I was looking at their fancy um, double-pull, double-throw switch, and, oh, wow, is that an eloquent alternative to what we tore apart and found inside the, the Hummer. And I thought the Hummer thing was just spot on beautiful until I saw this new one. So very cool stuff. But my, my point is that now they've opened up their infrastructure for other car companies to utilize. Um, they have a kind of a problem that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but that is that they don't have their 800 volt system together yet. They have to deploy it and it's slowly rolling out. Um, so, you know, even, um, this notion of, um, having boxes to do the adaptation or reorganizing the battery packs on the fly. My point is this was a brilliant move on Tesla's part because now they have a way of generating revenue that will help them fund what will be this next generation infrastructure, at which point, yeah, they're going to be 10 years ahead again. So my point of that is they keep doing these things that keep them positioned very well ahead of the competition. And I think that's, 
you know, one of their ploys. So what do you th- think about that? You know, it's brilliant from the perspective you just described where now all the other providers have got to step up their game all the way to, um, you know, now everyone's got a more friendly experience with this by being able to experience the supercharger network and its inherent improved liability. Your thoughts on that would be greatly appreciated. And I planted a bunch of seeds, pick any one of them and grow it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, as far as the 400 volt, 800 volt um, issues, they'll work it out. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any doubt that that Tesla has a grand master plan uh, on that. And uh, will it take years? Yeah, it'll take years. We're not going to, you know, um, you know, by the end of 2024, you know, have uh, all the solutions. You know, you have companies that like Lucid for a while. They they they're very hesitant to commit to NAX because you know they 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 want to. They don't think it'll be a good charging experience with the current hardware that Tesla has out there uh, for their customers. Um, but I I I think Tesla understands that the industry, a good portion of the industry, is going to transition to 800 volt. I think even down the road, not all vehicles will be 800 volt, but we'll we'll, we'll see we'll see how that plays out. Uh, so as you, as you mentioned, how Tesla just seems to manage to stay a step ahead of everyone, or, or 10 steps ahead of everyone. They 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 knew this was going to be an issue. I'm sure they're they're working on solutions, and um, it's going to mean you know a lot of investment and in upgrading infrastructure that they already have in the ground. Um, and, uh, I, I don't doubt that they'll do it. I just think it's going to take some time to, to get all that worked out. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're still, you know, we're still years away from having a stable coast to coast, you know, charging network in the country that's reliable and easy to use, you know, that I don't think we're going to have that till the early 2030s. So, you know, we, 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 it's going to, it's going to take a while and, and it's a good thing. Uh, that adoption isn't going to happen overnight that, you know, next year, we're not going to sell 20 million EVs because we, we wouldn't be able to handle it with the infrastructure we have. We have to solve these issues and improve infrastructure. Um, I do think that, you know, even though you've seen a lot of doom and gloom forecasts with EVs in the news lately, um, I do think we're kind of at the beginning of that hockey stick adoption rate, you know, where it's kind of it's been going and now we're right here and it's really going to take off over the next, three or four years, um, uh, and towards the end of this decade, for sure, the majority of personal transportation vehicles sold are going to be uh, fully electric. I, I, they certainly all won't be by the end of this decade, but the ma- majority will be. And hopefully, the infrastructure will have improved greatly over the next five or six years. Now, the, I know we're at a terrible place with infrastructure right now, you know, and, and there's so many questions. You brought up a really good one with Tesla's network and 400 volt, 800 volt, with the reliability issues of Electrify America and EVgo and ChargePoint and all that stuff. But as, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I've been driving EVs since 2009. And you think about it, I installed the first public charging station in the entire state of New Jersey in 2009. And, and you know, that's only 14 years ago. And look at where we're at, you know, in those 14 years. And I know everybody, looks at it and says, oh my God, infrastructure sucks and we're way behind. We need to have more. And I agree that we do. Of course we do. But we've come an enormous, the, the first four or five years I drove EVs, there was no movement on infrastructure. It really started happening around 2015-ish, somewhere around there. So in 10 years, look at how far we've come. Yes. So I, I'm very, I'm very hopeful. I'm very uh, uh, bullish on the fact that over the course of the next seven or eight years, we're going to have a dramatic improvement in, in public infrastructure. All right. So so what do you think about other value propositions for the, the charging companies? Uh, solar panels, is that a gimmick or can that actually contribute? I know you have your own solar installation for home. Um, you know, is that going to become a more popular thing? We're going to see solar canopies? I think so. Uh, you know, I I, th- I think um, uh, and th- there's a few companies out there uh, doing them right now, uh, but there's obviously problems with that because you know you just don't have enough surface in most instances to produce really enough electricity. Uh, I think it will help. I think um, it, many installations are going to have uh, solar canopies. They're going to have on-site energy storage, and I think the combination of the two is going to help. You know reduce that um that peak demand that um you know seems to cause a lot of problems with the grid when uh you know when everybody's trying to charge at rush hour during the day and 
Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a, a the peak demand seems to happen while there's daylight hours. So if the sun is shining, at least the solar could be contributing. The batteries uh, on site can help shave that off. Um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of that. Um, but, you know, I, I also think we're going to have more intelligent uh, charging stations in the future, let's say, you know, where everybody now plugs in and immediately wants the most amount of power they can have. Um, there might be uh, stations where you, you pay a little bit more if you get the full power in your car, like during peak hours. And maybe if you're not in a rush, you can you can pay half the price if you go inside and have a cup of coffee and take, you know, 60 kilowatts instead of, you know, that 200 kilowatts. If you really only need, uh, you know, 20 or 30 kilowatt hour to get to your destination, you don't have to plug in and immediately start pulling 200 kilowatts. I think we're going to see let's say charging uh, stations, platforms where there's uh, coffee shops and things like that and 30, 40, 50 chargers. And there might be uh, different pay rates depending on how much power you want it at any one given time if you're not in a rush. I think we're gonna see a lot of solutions to, to these problems, Tom. I, I, I think a lot of the solutions are things that aren't even on our radar right now. But but you know, industry is smart and, and they'll come up with solutions and we'll figure this out. and you know, we'll 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 get to that place where um, it might seem impossible right now because the state of infrastructure, DC fast charge infrastructure in particular, is is pretty poor here in the U.S. Really good visionary stuff. I really appreciate that, Tom. So, on to some other tangents. Um, again, leveraging um, out of spec Dave's interview. I do encourage people to watch that. It's excellent. Um, so there were a couple of takeaways from that, and one stood out. It, and it was maybe one of your more early motivations as you were thinking about what's the alternative to gasoline. There's got to be something, and you were compelled like a lot of us were. Um, and then you made the statement that you were open to anything, and, uh, you know, hydrogen is on that table. So I read the story about one of those situations you, you described, some mega charging center where a bunch of semi tractor trailers come in and they all need to charge at the same time and the joke was there isn't enough power from the local nu nuclear power plant to provide what they need at that moment so they did a calculation on how much battery storage they would need to provide the the transient response so you don't burden the grid too much and it was a, an incredible amount of space it was like two acres of space that they would need in this particular scenario and then um, they did an analogy with using a hydrogen storage tank instead of a battery, and um, the idea was um, electrolysis to create the hydrogen, the compressor to put it in the tank, and then a fuel cell to turn it back into electricity to charge these vehicles. And the space claim for that was an acre instead of two. So, yeah, you talk about the industry being uh, innovative and trying to find out-of-the-box solutions. Um, Hydrogen, whether we like it or not, is kind of part of that set of solutions. But I'm curious of your thoughts. And, and, you know, it has a lot of variants, everything from the storage I just described all the way to the practicality of using it for transportation as a fuel. So what do you think about hydrogen? Is it coming? Yeah, I think I think there's going to be a place for hydrogen uh, in the future. Um, I don't think it's going to be personal transportation. I do not think we will be driving hydrogen powered cars. Um, I think long haul trucking, I think aviation is going to be getting into hydrogen. Um, and the, re the real reason, one of the biggest reasons for this, now hydrogen works, the fuel cells work. We've, we've seen it. Many companies have demonstrated that it works. We are never going to build out a hydrogen infrastructure for, for across. It's just not going to happen, it, period. It's, it's not going to happen. We already have this extensive electricity infrastructure, it's already in place. You, you know, we, I mean, every outlet is a potential charging station. There's there's, there's billions of charging mm -hmm. stations available in the US already. Hydrogen for long haul trucking, let's say aviation might work because there's set stop points. Um, and uh, I mean, aviation is even better. Like you have to take off and land from an airport. You know, you're not, you're not, you know, your wife doesn't call you and all of a sudden you got to change the course of the plane and land somewhere else to pick up a gallon of milk, which, you know, happens with, when you're driving your car. And even with the long haul trucking, they have routes, you know, that that they, they know where they're going to stop. So I think it, 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 it 
it works for that. Uh, but I just I, I, I have I've heard so many people talk about hydrogen for personal transportation, for personal vehicles and everything. I haven't seen anybody be able to demonstrate a plan to install the, 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 the hydrogen charging stations. So states don't even allow it to be transported like through bridge uh, across bridges or through tunnels here in New Jersey. Um, Toyota, I think it was wanted to install some uh, a hydrogen station or two somewhere, and they couldn't because they couldn't get the hydrogen to them because it couldn't go across the George Washington mm -hmm. Bridge. And I mean, I remember years ago, Toyota, I was at the uh, auto show, the LA auto show. It had to be seven or eight years ago. And they were saying, within two years, we're going to have six hydrogen stations in your home state of New Jersey. And this was like eight years ago. Mm -hmm. there's, there's not one. And, um, you know, it just people don't want them in their neighborhood. They're afraid that there's, there's a problem, you know, the whole block's going to blow up. I mean, it might be an unfounded fear, but it's a fear nonetheless. Um, we're all very comfortable with electricity. Nobody's afraid of, you know, having a, a, a DC fast charging station on the corner of where they live. But you know what, you know, go to, go to a public meeting and, and try to get a, a, a hydrogen refueling station, you know, on the corner where there's a school. You'll have, half the town will be out protesting it so you know i just i don't see it happening for personal transportation and and hydrogen is a very poor carrier of energy it, it it takes a lot of electricity just to make this stuff and you know it's 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 so much simpler to just if you just take the electricity that it takes to make like a, a kilogram of hydrogen and put it in a a, a battery the car will go like six miles or something just the electricity it took to make it or, or to, to you know so I, I just don't see it happening for personal transportation. That's a, a fair assessment. And, you know, it kind of extends what I've known as an automotive engineer for my whole life. You know, 20 years ago, hydrogen was the future. It was only 10 years away. And then uh, 10 years it's ago. It's always 10 years yes, away. Yes, and even it's today. Always, <laughs> it's a fuel that's always, it's 10 years away. It's been 10 years away since the 50s. Exactly. You know, so George Bush's hydrogen economy, oh, yeah. remember, that was yes. in, in the... 90s. So. I remember the hydrogen highway with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his hydrogen Hummer fleet. And uh, yeah, they would schedule um, test drives of that thing that were exactly four miles because that was his range. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a comical thing then. And, and it remains so now. But I have to admit, I have some optimism about some of the breakthroughs in technology with regard to cleaner and lower energy ways of creating it and storing it. So maybe there's hope, but it's not anytime soon to your point. So uh, let me touch on hydrogen a little bit later, but I got kind of a segue to get us there. Um, so in this treasure trove of information that was on the out of spec Dave interview, um, I learned a lot about your past. You're um, kind of a, a BMW guy in some ways, having started out with uh, the, the Mini, and then ultimately, um, mm -hmm. you know, made your way to the i3, right? So the i3 is an interesting thing for me, all right? And I'm going to look to you for some guidance and poke some fun at it at the, at the beginning and then get serious. With the i3, I came here um, as a, uh, a, a lease person and we were renting space here at Monroe from my former company and I would walk by this BMW i3 that they had torn down this carbon fiber and aluminum fantastic piece of engineering and at first I was kind of repulsed by the way it looks and then it kind of grew on me you know and every time I walked by it I got more and more attracted to it. Monroe was selling the data for the car at that time for a half a million dollars. Um, I you know, got my company to buy some of that data and it was very helpful information about how it worked. Um, and then over time, you know, that data became less and less interesting. And I don't know, it was about a year ago, we put it on our website for $10, the data. I have a copy. I, I bought it too. <laughs> it was at that point then I said, you know, this car is part of my future, whether I like it or not. And I do like it now. So I started the strategy of, you know, cherry picking some of the the best photos I could find, you know, certainly the i3S is a lot better looking vehicle. So I take my wife aside and say, hey, what do you think of me getting one of these? She goes, oh, what's that? Oh, that's a BMW i3 and it's a technical marvel. Oh, she goes, oh, okay, well, you can buy one of those, but don't expect me to be a passenger in it. And I, ah, what do you, what do you do about that? You know, 
Have you got any advice for how to, you know, convince our wives? It's one of the best values you have out there right now as a used EV, especially with the federal tax incentive that's out there now. Uh, you can't get a better bang for your buck if your your range requirements aren't high. Tell us how to yeah. sell our spouses on this. <laughs> well, I, have to say, I didn't have to sell my spouse. My wife loved, I had two i3s, absolutely loved them, still misses them, still talks about how great it was to drive, she, how easy it was to park, how she loved driving it in New York City. She works in New York City, so it's a fantastic car for scooting around the city, dodging in and out of traffic, you know, parking it, fitting it in tight parking spaces. Um, my wife, I didn't have to sell her. She absolutely, it's one of her favorite cars. Um, to this day, she's like, God, I wish we had the i3 again. And um, my good friend just yesterday bought a 2020 i3S, Caparis white. So it's the white and black Stormtrooper, mm, nice. uh, uh, the fully loaded with the range extender, the Rex. Got it for 27000 mm. A 2020 with 2,800 miles. Oh, my God. And he got four thousand dollars from the federal government. Scooted it, but no, no, I don't think so because I think that oh, used, it's right, the used twenty five thousand. You're right. So he didn't, he didn't get that, but he was happy. He's like, this was a steal. So he drove to like Connecticut or something to get it, and um, he is so happy with it, and it's absolutely mint condition. You could pick up a used twenty twenty i three s with the range extender for like twenty seven, twenty eight thousand. Buy it and then convince your wife. <laughs> Or, because or get one with a few more miles. A little bit. With a few yeah. more miles on it, you can get it under yeah, 25K and get, under. and get another 4,000 off if you buy yeah. it from a qualified dealer. Yeah. So let, let your, as far as convincing them, let her drive it for a little while. And, you know, you, you tell her, look, maybe the outside isn't like, you know, the, the, the most the pleasant lines that you can have, but it, it grew on me. I like it. Um, and to be honest with you, you see those things driving down the road now, it still looks futuristic. It does. It's 10 years old. That launched 10 years ago this month mm. in Europe. And uh, it's a 10-year-old car. It looks more modern than 99% of the cars, maybe than anything but a Cybertruck, <laughs> right? What, what else looks more modern than an i3 going down the road, you know, like, or more futuristic? So, so I mean, there's more to the story that you have, I'm pretty sure, because you got T-boned at 45 miles an hour driving yours, and you're here to talk about it. So what was that like? You know, um, were you fearing that the car would light on fire? Was there carbon fiber all over the place? What was your experience after that accident? Yeah, no, um, I wasn't fearing a fire. I actually, so I was at a, stopped at a, at a red light. My light turned green. So I started going through the intersection, and as I got right through the middle of the intersection, this was a very busy road person coming across me didn't realize their light had turned green. They actually said they were looking at the radio. So they were going 45 miles an hour. So just, just T-bone me 45 miles an hour, right in the passenger side of the vehicle. And the interesting thing is the car like flexed in and like bounced back. Like, you know, it, it, I, I like saw the car, like the door, like come in and then it like bounced back to shape. So it was, it was really weird that like, um, I guess it's plastic door panels and, you know, I mean, there was damage inside the door panels and everything, but when I got out and walked around the car, it didn't like, you knew it was in an accident, but it didn't look like crushed in like the, the, all the panels were back out to where they were supposed to be. Yes. The, there was the frame cracked. So that totaled it. Um, the, the carbon fiber flame where the battery pack is broke, but, um, I wasn't afraid. Um, I didn't, I didn't even give it a second thought about it going on fire, to be honest with you. It's just, you know, that jarring when you get hit at 45 miles an hour, and I was going like maybe 10 miles an hour, just starting to go through the intersection, you know, it kind of shocks you for a second. And then you just get there and like, okay, I was just hit and uh, I seem to be okay. You know, um, that, it, that was tough. But I, I have another, if we have time, another interesting quick segue into talking about wondering if the car went on fire. Wasn't my first accident in an electric car. Back in 2012, um, do, you, do you know what the Act BMW Active E was? I do. It, they didn't bring okay. it out, but it was a teaser. It was a pilot program, mm -hmm. and I was in it. Um, and it was a uh, BMW converted a one series BMW to a, a fully electric, and they called it the Active E. It was, it was the test bed for the i3. The powertrain would eventually go in the i3. So I had that, and I was beta testing it from 2012 
2014. So I had a bad accident in that car. And this time I was on the highway and there was a car in the fast lane. I'm in the middle lane and the car didn't see me. I guess I was in his blind spot and he quick cut over. And before I could react, it was late at night. It was like midnight. He clipped the front of my car and I started sliding sideways. And there was a dump truck in the slow lane, fully loaded dump truck, 50,000 pounds. And it, we were going up a hill. So he was going like 15 miles an hour. And I was going 65, 70 miles an hour. And I slid sideways into the back of a dump truck at 70 miles an hour. And he was going 15 miles an hour. Total, total the car. I had to have two back surgeries because of that. But so now I'm in the ambulance and they're driving me to the hospital. And this was before electric cars really came out. You know, it was 2012. The, I don't even know if the, I guess the Leaf had launched and the, and the Volt. And um, I hear over the radio, um, like the the drivers getting real. Um, the cars on the cars on fire. The car just went on fire. Get get um uh, fire over here. So I'm assuming they're talking about my car, and I'm saying, oh my god, like they don't know this is an electric car because there were no electric cars out then. It's a BMW. So I I told the medic, I was like, let please, and I could barely talk because I was banged up bad. And I I said, uh, please tell the radio to the police. It's an electric car. Don't tell the firefighters not to approach it because if it's on fire it might be whatever just let it burn you know on the side of the road so um they radio back and i hear them going back and forth and uh they come back and they're like that's not your car on fire they said that's another that's another accident like down in newark or something you know what i mean but like and i'm thinking to myself the firefighter is going to get shocked and killed and like this is going to like kill the electric vehicle movement you know what i mean like yeah <laughs> and, uh, and, work, and i'll be responsible all and your I'd work be responsible. to the wind yes I, I would be the one that killed the electric car you know so uh <laughs> but that was funny but it wasn't and uh you know uh, you, you know another anecdote from the video i watched was your statement about how the model s or the uh, s variant of the i3 um it had a much better punch, if you will. You described, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour. It just f- felt a lot stronger. And that thought, I'm like, thinking, okay, yeah, 70 mile an hour roll shot. Surely this is in a closed test course or maybe somewhere south of the border, but never mind that. It seems to me that you're a bit of a performance enthusiast. And I dug a little deeper and found that you had an RX-7. So, I, you know, tell us about that. I mean, that's an alternative drivetrain. Um, I can see what yeah. drew you to it. Uh, but I, I, you know, without spending too much time, you know, do you miss it? Is it or you still have it? Yeah, I actually own two. I owned a 1986 and uh, turbo. And then I had a 93 twin turbo. That's when the last generation RX-7s came out. And uh, I actually had some work done to that too. And uh, it was a blast. That car was absolutely a blast. I love it. I still think it has some of the nicest lines of any car made. It just, I used to love just washing and waxing it. Just like, uh, you know, looking at it when it was all done and going down the side, wiping it off. I I, I thought, you know, Mazda really created a uh, it was like a work of art to me that that um that generation rx7 and then the rx8 came out and ruined it all yeah <laughs> i also had a honda crx si i had two of them that that, that might have been one of my favorite car of all time it was the first car i saved my money up and bought myself the little two-seat crx si and that was the sport version and i put a nitrous oxide kit on it in 1986 and it was a 50 pound boot a, a 50 horsepower boost so that little 1800 pound car hauled. Yes. That was a lot of fun. I too have a lot of experience using nitrous oxide injection on cars. So yeah. I'll save that for another time. Um, but yeah, power adders are a lot of fun, especially uh, when they raise the power level like that did. But this Mazda rotary engine, um, you know, it's kind of alluring. We always thought maybe it'll find a place in life someday. I know with my own engineering efforts, trying to create a range extender, it's a really tough proposition. The I3 being kind of a good example of how you get hyped up and then disappointed if it's undersized or, you know, worse yet, you know, the focus groups get involved and say, "Uh, well, should it really be running at two thirds of its speed load point at the traffic light. It looks, sounds like it's gonna explode and now you idle it down, it doesn't work. Anyway, long story short, the secret to a range extender was a smooth engine that 
didn't cause a problem with NVH, right? And that engine is that. This is the, one of the smoothest running engines you can have. And lo and behold, it's still alive, and Mazda's bringing it out. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Do you see a range extender with the, the rotary? Well, and they've talked about it, right? They, it's, Mazda's, it's, it's coming. Mazda's talked about doing that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to see, and I think, I think you're right. I think it would make uh, sense to do that. Although, you know, the whole plug-in hybrids and range extenders, I think it's a short-lived need. Um, I think I, I, I really I think it's like a, a solution to a problem we have now and, and are going to have for like five or six years. I don't think it's a long-term solution that we'll need, except for maybe some heavy equipment and, um, you know, uh, trucks, work trucks that need to cover very long distances and work in very cold, cold climates. Um, but I just don't think that that's something that passenger vehicles are going to are going to need in, in 10 years. Yeah. And that brings me back to the hydrogen subject. So turns out that if you had to burn hydrogen in a combustion engine, the the Wankel rotary is ideally suited. It doesn't have hot spots and it runs so smooth. So, yeah, it's very clear to me there was a version of it that was only sold in Japan that was dual fuel gasoline and hydrogen, I think in the 80s. Um, it didn't get very popular, but, you know, they knew then and they know now that it's suited for that. And the entire Japanese industry, you know, Toyota especially, seems to be strangely focused on hydrogen combustion. You might have seen there, they've got a little race car. This year they transformed the race car into um, a liquid fuel uh, variant and boy talk about an expensive fuel uh, energy intensive uh, yeah to say the least but if it's a race car and you know there's no real budget constraint then yeah it seems to work well and my other proof of that might be near and dear to you and you may remember this thing called the hydrogen 7 from bmw back in the day mm -hmm. did you ever have any look at that as you were that was right during that era where you were thinking uh, what's the alternative to gasoline and what a disappointment that it wasn't accepted that was liquid fueled um yeah did you remember that program? I, I saw it in person. I never drove it. Okay. Uh, I, I saw one of the vehicles. I've driven in the uh, the X5 hydrogen that BMW has now, um, but um, uh, I never drove in the hydrogen seven. Um, I mean, there's a lot of cars out there you, you could you could see from a lot of manufacturers uh, because it's always been a tempting proposition the hydrogen, but it just go back to the infrastructure. And as far as like hydrogen as a range extender. That my thoughts on that is kind of like, well, you know, one of the reasons we need range extenders are because batter, the, the EVs can't go quite as far. There aren't enough charging stations. If we had a, if we had high-powered EV charging stations, you know, everywhere, DC fast charging stations, we didn't need range extenders because if you could plug in anywhere and just get recharged in five, 10 minutes, we, we, you wouldn't need a range extender. So now you're, you're adding a fuel that you're you're making the range extender run on a fuel that we don't know if we're going to be able to get refueling stations out there so it's like the the last thing i would want is a hydrogen range extender like i would want the, the my range extender to run on the most accessible fuel possible because if i'm if i need a range extender because i can't charge my car or i can't wait long enough to charge my car so i want to be able to i want to be able to refuel that thing really quickly anywhere i need to so i'm i'm looking at gas or diesel if i want a range yeah, extender yeah, don't believe um, a bit but you know you do have to step back and go what are they doing over there in japan and why all this emphasis on hydrogen what do they know we don't know and uh, i guess we should just leave it at that it's also a very small country and they might be able to light the country up with with enough fueling stations you know, we can't like Ugh, it, 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 it's like it's like a slither of the East Coast, all of Japan. You know, I, I don't know. Land mass size was it like an eighth of this of the of the U.S. or a tenth. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's 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 they might be able to accomplish something that we could. They already have a Chatamo network coast to coast. Everywhere you go that they have DC fast charging stations everywhere. Like we 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 can't match what they've done with dc fast chargers they might be able to light the whole country up with with hydrogen stations but i i'd like to see us do that here and europe do that across europe yeah the, i think the only hope we have here is a little bit about you know how we started out <clears throat> with our own electrification infrastructure we did it at home you did it at home you did it at all the places that you traveled to um and in the beginning uh, if i remember the story it was 
four or five locations that BMW help, help pay for so that you would have a place to plug in all, all the places you like to go. So we could theoretically have our own hydrogen uh, production and uh, storage system at home. I don't know how many people are ready to sign up for that. They got enough problem with their natural gas. Uh, they don't want to tank a hydrogen on board. So anyway, we'll see on that one. Um, what we should probably do is kind of focus on um, back on charging systems. This is uh, a really strong area of your focus and um, certainly with a breadth of experience that I'd love to tap into a little bit here. So um, we all thought that there was a big problem with supercharging degrading our batteries. You know, any sort of DC fast charge accelerated the demise of the battery. And then, you know, some data came out a, a few weeks ago that kind of put that all back into question again. You know, um, the, the Teslas that have had lots of data collected on them weren't showing characteristically um, greater degradation of the battery as a result of supercharging. So you wonder also, though, when you see a study like that, you know, it's the devil in the details. You know, did they look at what happened also with those who like to fill to 100% and then drain to zero? And, you know, was that included as part of the equation? I'm going to guess you've got some insight on this or maybe even some personal experience. I know you've, uh, in some of your cars, you've collected a lot of your own data and looked at it. So, so what do you think? Two things, charging fast, um, you know, and its degradation and charging um, too high and discharging too low. Um, what are the real detrimental effects there that people should worry about? So, yeah, I mean, heat is the biggest enemy. Um, it, it, of course, it's bad to charge to 100 percent, particularly if you're going to leave it sit. Uh, if if you're like I on occasion will charge my EVs to 100 percent if I know I'm going to go on a really long drive. But I time it so that it finishes up charging right when I'm getting in the vehicle and going. And um, from the battery engineers that I've talked to, if you're going to charge 100%, that's the way to do it. You, you don't want it to sit at 100%. Same thing when you drain your battery down low, which I've done many, many times. Um, I won't leave, you know, get it under 10% or under 5% and then park it, let it sit for a day before I plug it in. If, if I'm on a long road trip or going somewhere and I really drain it down, as soon as I'm done driving, I plug it in to get it back up. And from what I understand, that that's that really helps take the edge off, say, uh, charging to a high limit or 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 draining the battery to a very low limit. It's not necessarily the 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 fact that you're charging it high. It's that you don't want to let it sit. Now, of course, it's not good to constantly charge it uh, to 100 percent, even if you're going to time it perfectly. But on occasion, if you do that, um, I don't think it's 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 going to really make much of a difference long term. Um, and you're, you're referring to, I think the recurrent study on the Tesla DC That's fast charging. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things that Tesla has done well in the past is thermal management on, on their batteries and, and keeping them, um, at a, at a decent temperature when they're supercharging, uh, you'll take a look at a company, say like Nissan, and they haven't done as well. Now the Aria has a, a good sophisticated thermal management system. At least we think it is. The Leaf, uh, but not so much. <laughs> their, their first generation vehicle didn't have that. It had a passive air cooling system. And we saw a lot of degradation, particularly, I mean, on EVs that, that DC fast charge, even though the Leaf's DC fast charge rate is very low, it still accelerated its degradation because they, they, the batteries just got too hot. Same with the, the LEAP owners that lived, say, in like in Arizona, where it gets really hot. And the vehicles are just parked out in the parking lot, just baking, and they had no way to keep themselves cool, no thermal management system to turn on and, and cool the battery. So I think that's a big, uh, a big part of uh, the reason why Teslas seem to have performed well, even the ones that were DC fast charging, Tom, was that Tesla has good thermal management system. And a lot of companies have good thermal management systems. Uh, out a lot there. of them I think have that, really bad thermal management yeah. systems we've torn a uh, lot a, a lot of them apart and you can see you would why be better good. you would be better to talk uh, uh to that 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 than i am but i think that they understand that 
that's going to play a big role in the longevity. And what you've torn down for the most part are first generation thermal management systems on 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 almost all the car companies, probably I'm guessing. Um, you know, and and I'd imagine they're learning and and improving them, or at least they should be as 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 the second gen and third gen EVs from those companies come out. I think they they understand that you know heat is the is going to be a big enemy um, to the battery packs. Yeah, it's interesting too because we've maybe not even noticed it with our phones, but a lot of them have algorithms in them now where they learn your sleep habits. And when you're charging while you're sleeping, it'll charge to say 80% and then wait until mm -hmm. just before you're getting ready to wake up, at which point, yeah, you'll be at 100%, but you'll start using it right away, just as your yep. point was in charging a car to 100%. Yep. Um, and likewise, with our phones, hey, if we get anywhere near down to zero, we're all in a panic and we want to get it charged up right away. So our phones have, you know, through the years, been able to last a lot longer um, because of these sorts of algorithms. Um, so yeah, it's nice to make the correlation back to commercial electronics every now and again, um, things that we um, tend to take for granted. But now it's all the big concern when it comes to it being our mode of transportation. So yeah, good, good stuff there. Um, so with that, you know, I, um, you know, I can see that I, I did touch a nerve with you in, in high performance, and uh, I wanted to, you know, repeat a quote of yours that was in that video that just really touched home for me. And it was, every now and then I ask myself, is anything really more than fast enough? Right. The, the analogy was the Model 3 that you drove um, in comparison to, say, something like an i3. Um, what, a, what a contrast. And a lot of people would say, why do you need that? Uh, you know, we didn't need that before. So, you know, give us the insider perspective. Is, you know, what is that compelling reason that we want more and more acceleration performance when there aren't very many places we can use it? Right. Uh, it's funny because... You know, when, when a new EV comes out, everyone looks at, what's the zero to 60? I mean, it could be a family sedan, you know? And it's like, oh, zero to 60 in only six seconds? Like, that's slow. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years ago, 25 years ago, like, the, the sports cars didn't do it. Like, when I, I'm a kid of the 80s, you know, the even Porsches didn't go zero to 60, uh, I don't think, in under five seconds. Or, or maybe one or two of them did. Like, the real real super if you got down on the fours you were like crushing it you know and um it's like now the, the, the like a minivan's got to go zero to 60 in five seconds or it's garbage you know exactly. and uh it, it's just not it's just not needed you know you know once you get you know for a vehicle to be safe you know what i mean let's say for it to have enough acceleration to get on the highway and everything i'd love it to be you know eight seconds the, the, you know, that, that in that range, as far as, you know, um, feeling like it has enough power to, to really get you to where you're going. And every, even the slowest EVs today are faster than that. So it's like, I, it's, it's just a number quarter mile time. And every, everyone's using the Tesla as a, as their measuring stick because Tesla came out and just, you know, built these incredible vehicles that, that just straight line are just rockets. I mean, the plaid's insane. You're talking under, under two seconds, zero to sixty. Um, and I've I've had plenty of opportunities to drive the plaid, and I've launched it um, many times. And one time I had one, and I did three or four launches in a row, and I had to pull over because I was getting sick. You know, it was like <laughs> at, at the it, it was draining the blood from my head. You know, it's like do you really? Is I mean, it's fun, but you know. You, you know, I wouldn't like if I owned that car, I wouldn't let my 17 year old kid drive it. Like I know if I had that when I was 17, I wouldn't be here today. You See, know, would, yeah, <laughs> you and I have driven combustion cars that we thought were fast and they're nothing yeah. compared to what's I out know. here today. Yeah. And how many times do we even our own selves driving it, you know, push it to an edge where we thought we might lose control. And yeah. yeah it, it's very deceiving how much power yeah. that is. And it's kind of a scary thing that it's in yeah. the hands of the general public. But where does it end? You know, the Model S, we th the Plaid, we thought that maybe this is it. But then now we have the Sapphire, right? So, yeah, I know. yeah, so, you know, um, you know, the most, most fun you can have for under a million dollars, I guess. Um, yeah. So, you know, 
what's the future of this? Is are we going to stop this juggernaut of going quicker and quicker, or you know, are we past the need for that? At, at some point, we're, we're going to stop because I think at some point, I mean, I, I do think at some point down the road, it's not going to happen for a long time. We will have self-driving cars, but it's not going to happen for a long time, in my opinion, at least. It's not where you're not going to be able to get in your car and say, you know, take me to work, and then you know, open up your iPad or whatever and just not look and just let the car take you the whole way. Um, you know, just think about it. What, when we get to that, and a lot of people do believe we're going to get to that. What's the need for performance at that point? You know, the the the, the vehicles will never use it, you know. And, Good and point. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think there'll always be a performance enthusiast and I may always be one because I've always, you know, that's always been in my blood. But I do think that the automobile is going to evolve into I, it pains me to say it more of an appliance no, than, just you know, use that word. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's true. Right, Tom. I it mean, it, it, you know, it, 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 that's going to happen. I know that, that, you know, I got a lot of friends and, you know, muscle car buddies that, you know, we spent a lot of hours, you know, working on old Chevelles and old Mustangs and in, in garages, half of them never, we never quite got them on the road, but we spent a lot of time and drank a lot of beer doing it and had a lot of fun. But um, it would pain them to hear me say that. But uh, I do think that that's, that's what we're going to. Look at the younger generation. The, 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 the kids that are like, um, God, I sound so old saying that, but like 17, 18, 19 year olds, they have no interest in cars. They'd rather just take Ubers places. We couldn't wait to get our driver's license. You know, we couldn't wait to get in our first car it, because it was freedom for us. That was my way to experience the world. Once I got a car, I can go out and experience things. Now, th this is how they experience things. With this in their hand, they can see the world. We couldn't. We needed to have that car. So that was such an emotional connection to our cars to, to, to let us see the world. Whereas today, they're on their computers and their cell phones, they're experiencing the world. Not like we did, but at least they can see what's out there and talk and communicate with people. We, we had to do it physically. So we're about out of time, but I have to kind of close with uh, another weird anecdote. And, you know, I'll maybe have to ask you to, you know, pull a favor from someone you might know or at least followed for a while. He coined a term that I think needs to be refreshed. Um, he, our fellow uh, uh, great musician, artist um, that said... Uh, chrome wheel, chrome wheeled fuel injected and stepping out over the line. You know, you mentioned Chevelles. Uh, yes, we, uh, I think we need that line or, or the song updated to kind of, you know, bring it into the modern age and show that, you know, that was a song where yeah. in my high school they promoted it because he was a very clean cut, wholesome guy, Bruce. Springsteen, and we're saying yeah. for those. Who I just don't know. saw him. In, I just saw him live, like two months ago, at but, the Meadowlands here in New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, but you know the clean cut guy that he was. You know the song that they promoted on the high school stage that we should all be following instead of all this nefarious stuff was all about street racing, and yeah. I thought, wow. Um, I guess they didn't listen to the lyrics when they decided to tell the high school kids about this. But um, anyway, like I said, yeah, give give Bruce a nudge there, and maybe he can. Uh, he can write a song that we know he's a gearhead. We know he's passionate about that. I don't know whether he likes electric vehicles or not, but uh, yeah. You're from New Jersey. Maybe you can have some influence on that. Yeah, next time <laughs> I have lunch with Bruce, we'll, uh, we'll, right. we'll chat about that it. That works for me. All right. Well, Tom, it's been fun. I really appreciate your time and your insights. And uh, yeah, we had some good back and forth here, touched on a lot of topics. Um, truly appreciate it. I'm pretty sure the Monroe Live viewer public will say the same. And uh, thanks.